sustainability finance policy at Syracuse University, and I oversee the Syracuse Center for the University. Um, one of the things that I'm in, in a, extremely interested in is this, this question of the uh, interface between science and policy, how science and technology feed into policy, and how we can do a better job at making that, that <coughs> happen. Uh, today we have um, a, a, rep, a representative from the Science Policy Exchange, which was created uh, in part by Syracuse University, along with uh, five other research institutions aligned with four long-term ecological research sites across the, the Northeast. And the idea was to include the impact of environmental science on environmental policy and decision making. And so Kathy Lambert, who is here with us today, is the director of the Science Policy Exchange. She's also a project director for science and um, policy integration at the Harvard Forest. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the way that the Science Policy Exchange operates and how a, a very successful project uh, was conducted. And Charlie Bristol, one of our own, um, our university professor of environmental systems um, uh, engineering and Department of Civil and, and Environmental Engineering in the College of Engineering and, and uh, Computer Science. So um, Charlie was the lead investigator <coughs> for the project and, and Kathy um, is the, the, the lead of Charlie. And, <laughs> 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 no, I'm only kidding. Um, and so I, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the, the co-benefits of the uh, clean carbon uh, plan and some of the options, policy options um, that the science is feeding. So, so it's a great project and we welcome you today and thank you for coming. There are a number of people signed up on the webinar, so you have uh, more than more than what's in more people engaged than they're in the room. So don't you don't want to forget them. If they can't hear, they should let us know. Yeah, they should let us know. Yes, they have our chat box that they can type into. Okay. Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Terry, and thank you all for coming. It's really nice to be here. I tend to get here, I think, maybe once a year to talk a little bit about the Science Policy Exchange and the collaboration that um, we're involved in with folks at Syracuse. And today I'm really excited to talk a little bit about this project, uh, which, as the title says, is looking at air quality, health, and ecosystem co benefits of different policy options that we have carbon standards. And this builds on a paper that we published in May 2015. Um, Charlie is the lead author in the journal Making Climate Change. So for today's talk, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the SPE. I'd like to give a bit of an introduction to the Clean Power Plan and what we're talking about when we talk about co-benefits of, of a clean power plan. And then um, Charlie will talk about the actual results from the, our first phase of the analysis of these policy options, and then also give you a little bit of a preview of some work that we just started looking at the final clean power plan as it was introduced by EPA. And then at the end, um, I'll circle back and share with you some of what we did for our science communication and outreach work and how that went when we were in some so the Science Policy Exchange is a collaborative, and our mission is to increase the impact of um, science on environmental policy and conservation. And it comes very much, it was created by research institutions, kind of for research institutions. So there are NGOs, and there are think tanks, and there are other organizations that bring science into policy, but we really wanted to start with the researchers and the research that they're doing and understand how that could better inform um, policy management. So we were founded by these uh, six institutions, um, and Charlie just still played a lead role in that and helping to define what we would be and how we would collaborate. Um, we're about four and a half years old now, and we have a number of projects under our belt. And through these projects, we've developed additional collaborators. And so I've shown some of those collaborators here. Interestingly, we're becoming increasingly transdisciplinary because, as you can imagine, many of these policy and management questions cross disciplinary boundaries. So not only are we working with different types of ecosystem scientists and engineers, but also economists and health scientists. Um, 
Um, and that's really, I think, a strength of our approach. So SP is a different kind of institution in that we also, our work is to work at the boundary, to span the boundary between science and policy and management. So we're trying to get really good at building a strong interface. And we do that by developing programs that facilitate dialogue in both directions. So it's not just about scientists presenting findings to decision makers. It often starts with this first process, this first function of engagement, scientists listening to stakeholders. And they could be local to federal stakeholders. About what are the questions that they have and what are some upcoming kind of decision moments that the science could be really helpful in informing? And then from there, we tend to engage in what well, we do a lot of fundraising together. And then we engage in synthesis. So we're, we're looking not so much to do new research, but to bring together existing data, models, and apply that to a synthesis process to a policy or management question. And then the third, our third major function is the communication and outreach. And so once we've done this synthetic work, uh, actually developing and implementing a pretty um, thorough and rigorous comprehensive uh, communication strategy. So who are we as individual people? Um, so we have a very modest staff. It's myself and a program manager. And then as, because we sort of grow and shrink with our project load, so we rely on some consultants from time to time for that surge capacity when we need it. And then we're managed by this governing council, which um, Sherry chairs, and we've been, it's been really fabulous to kind of be able to harness some of her expertise from Washington, D.C. and bring that into our group, help make us smarter about how we work at that interface. And then, <coughs> as you can see here, representatives from each of the institutions who help to create it. So, one of the things about ecosystems is everything's interconnected and interrelated. Uh, but we felt like we should try to define some key initiatives that we could become known for. And so we established these three major strategic initiatives, and then we have projects in each of those areas that we've co-developed with scientists and stakeholders, and then jointly fundraised to support. Combination of um, public agency grants and private funding. So, um, our approach is pretty straightforward. It's really, we start with kind of a, a, a scanning exercise uh, where we're always looking, reading the news, talking to colleagues, talking with agency folks, um, people on the Hill, to understand what big issues are coming down the pipe that we could perhaps play a role in. So we use that scanning work to identify key issues and questions. Um, then we bring together these transdisciplinary teams, and then we work through kind of our three-tier approach. We've done this now in, in this configuration for four different, types, four different projects. Um, prior to that, we took a very similar approach at the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation and three and did an additional three or four projects. So it's a pretty um, well-tested model at this point. So for this particular project that we're talking about today, these were our collaborators. <coughs> So it was um, led by Charlie Bristol here in Syracuse, and then there were collaborators from each of these institutions. Um, we brought in the Harvard School of Public Health and um, Boston University School of Public Health uh, because we really wanted to look at co-benefits broadly speaking, and they were the top health experts. So if you know any of these people at, at Harvard, it was Joel Schwartz and Jonathan Unicor, and at BU it was Jonathan Levy. So in this particular project, um, we, we wanted to be to look at real policy options. That was pretty easy to do because there were there was a consortium of groups who were already creating model runs of real policy options. So we could basically borrow those. We also wanted to apply some of what we knew about what barriers existed to climate action. So what we know from the literature on climate communication and climate science, things like the size of the threat um, being very large and insurmountable, feeling that way. The, the distance of the effect, both in space and time, 
sort of make people less um, um, likely to take action. And then also a feeling that it's just a big problem, there aren't tangible solutions that will make a difference, or it's another barrier to action. So we tried to very deliberately take those on in this project by constructing an analysis that in addition to having research-driven questions, would also look at benefits of solutions, not just harm of problems, right? And that would also provide information that would look at those benefits as they occurred in the very near term and where people live. So it's not, you know, it's not something happening in the Arctic 50 years from now. It's potential benefits to them, you know, in the matter of weeks and months where they live. And then we also base the analysis on very well established literature, public health and ecosystem science literature. So we weren't necessarily breaking new theoretical ground. Well, we were applying that existing theory and data and models to a very policy relevant question. So, um, a quick little one slide primer on co benefits. Um, so, you can think of co benefits as if you have power plant emissions and a clean power plant is targeted at reducing CO2 emissions from power plants. And the direct benefits of that are to help address global climate change. But there are other responses, right? So when you affect the power system and you change power from a power plant, you can also affect other pollutants, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter. So that's a co-benefit, reducing those other emissions. And those are local to regionally transported pollutants that have when you reduce them, air quality benefits. So you can see reductions in ground level ozone, smog, fine particulate matter. And from those air quality benefits, there are then derivative health co benefits that can be quantified in terms of numbers of premature deaths avoided, respiratory illnesses avoided, hospitalization, and then also improvements to ecosystems. So we can quantify changes in um, crop and timber productivity, as well as visibility, um, and asset deposition. So Charlie's going to share with you some of the results of the analysis and those co-benefits, but I just wanted to set the stage for that. So the clean power plant is targeting those carbon dioxide emissions from power plants, and then along with that, we're getting other emissions reductions. The clean power plan is happening against the backdrop of a lot of other policy that's been underway for many years, for decades, that's already helping to drive a clean energy transition. So we have a number of federal policies, the acid rain program, the mercury and air toxic standards, uh, the clean air, um, cross-state air pollution rules, the regional haze rule, all of these things are controlling emissions and in doing so affecting the power system, effectively driving a transition to cleaner energy. And then at similarly at the state level, there's a number of state level standards being put in place. And this is important not just because it's great, it's great that we're getting cleaner energy, but also to recognize that states and utilities are sort of on a glide path to cleaner energy right now. And sort of what we're looking at is effectively ensuring that that continues by putting it into a, a rule and a standard. So, and then in addition to the, the policy action, we have, of course, lower natural gas prices, which has been driving us towards cleaner energy. So here's a uh, union of concerned scientists put together these maps. They're still pretty up to date, just showing us what's been going on at the state level. So these are renewable electricity standards or renewable energy portfolio standards. Uh, 29 states in D.C. Uh, have these standards in place. Pretty impressive. Then there are also energy efficiency resource standards here. These are often funded through things like public benefit um, charges. I think NYSERDA probably manages that program here in New York State. So this is now 25 states, just slightly out of date, uh, have these uh, energy efficiency standards in place. And then um, you probably are aware that there's sort of an East Coast, West Coast split on carbon cap programs. 
So Reggie is the Northeast program. It's nine states, uh, which is New England, New York, Maryland, Delaware, including Pennsylvania, between, and then California. So these programs put in place a cap that they're trying to meet at the state or regional level and set up a trading system where sources can buy credit from other uh, utilities or other places to meet that cap or they can reduce their emissions to meet that cap. So if you look at it, you can really see over time, 1950 to the present, we're, we are experiencing this shift in where our electricity generation is coming from. So this shows you the percentage of the total electricity generation in the U.S. that comes from different sources. And so the most the obvious thing that you notice is around the time of the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, we start to see this big decrease in electricity from coal plants. And then parallel to that, we also see this increase in natural gas plants and an increase in the non-hydro renewable. So that's wind. Solar, I think biomass is actually in that category as well. Interesting, I think, to us now, and I wonder in retrospect um, kind of how we'll think about this, but the hydro line has been increasing over that time too. So hydro kind of has an interesting history. Does anyone know what was going on around that time that might have led to that? Yeah. So, well, to decrease the world as a percentage because of other sources coming online for the decades. But in addition, in the 90s, there were a lot of plants that were due for relicensing that did not meet environmental standards for um, things like commercial fisheries. Yeah, exactly. There were and recreational fisheries and other recreational interests. Yeah, exactly. Right, right around in the early 1990s, just in the Northeast, there was 30 to 50 year relicensing of hydro dams and all the interesting <coughs> fluctuations came up and that reduced the, the production coming out of those so not surprisingly, we see that emissions from um, electricity generating units sort of track that same pattern. Where we have, this is 1975, 1970 to the present, we see projections into the future pretty dramatic increases in um, both um, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. Um, because in addition to the, the change in the proportion of the, the generation from the different types of uh, plants, the coal plants that remain were often being scrubbed in place. So you have this very large de decrease in uh, SO2 emissions. So that's the backdrop against which the Clean Power Plan, the Obama administration, um, proposed the Clean Power Plan. And when this idea first came up, this is how it was framed by President Obama in 2013. Um, we limit the amount of toxic chemicals like mercury and sulfur and arsenic in our air or our water. So power plants can still some unlimited amounts of carbon pollution. Interesting, so CO2 now becomes pollution. Um, this is after the Massachusetts versus EPA case where they were given the authority to regulate CO2 as a pollution uh, into the air for free. So that's not right, that's not safe, and it needs to stop is what he says in this quote. And then from there, um, shortly thereafter, about a year later, the EPA introduced the draft clean power plan. So the target for the clean power plan is to reduce CO2 emissions um, by 32% from 2005 levels by 2030 um, from fossil fuel fire plants. And they used a part of the Clean Air Act called Section 111D to do this, and which allows for some of you may be familiar. How many are you familiar with MAC or BAC? Okay, MAC both maximum achievable control technology. This uses a different system under Section 111D. It's the best system of emission reduction. And EPA has interpreted system here very broadly to mean that it can include everything from energy efficiency to fuel switching uh, to heat rate improvements at power plants. So it's a much it's, as it's been constructed and used here, it's a performance-based standard, not a technology-driven standard, and it's a system approach as opposed to a plant-by-plant approach. So it's expected to, to sort of basically um, strengthen and accelerate those current trends we just saw in the transition to cleaner energy. 
and it sets for each state a target that they have to reach. So it's either a rate-based target or the state can decide whether to use a rate-based target in pounds per megawatt hour or a mass-based target in tons to um, establish their implementation plan. And the target for each state is based on its historical uh, production profile and emissions. States have a lot of flexibility in how they can implement this, so set their state implementation plans. And as I said, they have all these different options, and also as well as averaging across the fleet to achieve the standard, or trading, buying and selling allowances to meet the standard. And um, as is what's required by executive order and applies here, um, a cost for a major new rule like this, a cost benefit analysis is expected. It has been done in this case. So has has any of you been heard about this plan? And kind of so it was it's it's been stayed. So it was introduced uh, the final clean power plan in August 2015. 27 states, I think <coughs> the final number, maybe it was more, I think it was 27 in the end, sued the EPA. Um, and it was probably over that definition of system. So these states argue that EPA didn't have the authority to regulate, quote unquote, outside the fence line of the power plant or of the facility. And um, took EPA to court. The Supreme Court issued a stay, which is not a determination of, of um, pro or con on the rule, but basically said, EPA, you can't implement this until it's decided. And it was remanded to the DC Circuit Court and oral arguments were held just last month. So this is a very, very hot topic. Um, and a decision is expected by the end of this year. So as you can imagine, this is going to be a big issue going into the next administration. And those who think they know tell me that sometime in the summer or fall of next year, the Supreme Court will be likely to pick it up because whatever the DC Circuit Court decides, they're likely to be likely to be appealed. So I'm going to hand it over now to uh, to Charlie Bissell, who will actually share with you the results of the analysis. Well, maybe it might be useful to also say that the the targets that were proposed for the Clean Power Plan were also a critical piece of the Paris Agreement. Our what we were we committed to in terms of the, uh, the Paris Treaty. Uh, treaty. Uh, so, as Kathy said, she's handing off to me on talking about the, uh, the projects that we evaluated, different policy options, uh, and then um, we have a new project to try to look at this system. As Kathy indicated, this uh, paper came out uh, last year, and uh, we had a team of, of people that uh, looked into uh, who were the co-authors on the paper, and so we did the air quality analysis as well as the health benefit analysis. We have another group of people that we've been working with to try to characterize the ecosystem benefits. We're not only interested in health benefits, but also interested in ecosystem benefits. Although it doesn't get much attention, I personally think it's quite, quite important. Okay, so we have three questions that we wanted to uh, try to address in this case here. Are there air quality and health core benefits associated with different uh, standards, options for standards for power plants. If so, how uh, large, when, and where would they, uh, they And again, how do these different options for standards influence uh, what the response is, the geographic distribution and to of the co-benefit? So this is a cartoon to illustrate the approach that we use. We, I'll talk about these in a second. There were a reference case and three scenarios. I should say that when we, we started this, we started this project actually before the administration announced their program for the clean power plant. So we had no idea what they were planning on doing. And we tried to press them, get ideas. So we wanted to try to look at options that were very far apart, very diverse options that look at hot, broad differences among these various policies. Because frankly, we had no idea what they were going to it wasn't for the lack of trying. Uh, so we have these three options, which I'll, uh, I'll talk to you about in detail in a second, and we compare them to a reference case, which is a business-as-usual scenario. 
So we put the information concerning these options into a utility uh, planning model, the integrated planning model, which is used by the federal government, state utilities to make projections in terms of uh, utility use and fuel sources. We take the output from that model, which has uh, site specific emission information from electric utilities, and we put it into a fairly comprehensive air quality model known as CMAP. CMAP stands for Community Multi Scale Air Quality Model. We then took the output from CMAX, so it was more run for one year under each of these scenarios. This is a sort of a low budget project. What did one year? And then we put them into a household benefit model called BenMAP. This was done by the Harvard folks and I think the folks from Boston University. And then we also took the output and we looked at across a number of uh, ecosystems uh, benefits. Uh, Reductions in acid rain, improvements in visibility, reductions in ozone effects on crops and production. Okay, so a little bit about the modeling activity. Because we were interested in local scale response, and I should say with some pride that this wasn't the approach that EPA used. We tried to try to get very detailed information on what the local scale benefits we can, we can use. So we used a, a 12 kilometer grid. Um, application of CMAX so we could get relatively local scale air quality. So we had the key emissions uh, and then we looked at the output and the output were used by our various partners to quantify the health and the system benefits. And we looked at ambient air quality, ozone and particulate matter and we also looked at atmospheric information. So a little bit about the uh, various cases. So the reference case, we took the EIA output up uh, outlook for 2013 and we projected that to a year that we did this analysis for which is 2013. <coughs> now remember we have no information from the EPA so we have no idea what year they're going to they're going to do this for so we picked the year 2020 the actual year is 2030 in their case but uh, it's what we it's what we did and so all the current air quality policies that Kathy talked about were soon to be fully implemented some additional assumptions that, that were put into place. So what the reference case uh, would do was for our year 2020, there was a 15.2% 15, 15 reduction in carbon dioxide emissions from 2005. Okay, we, we then look at three separate scenarios. These, separate, these scenarios are very uh, contrasting end members. First one, uh, we'll call power plant improvement. So this is an inside defense line option. This is an option that has been uh, advanced by specific utilities. This is the one that uh, Kathy mentioned is really at, at, uh, is being uh, discussed in the uh, Supreme Court case. It's a low stringency, low flexibility. It really allows just only on-site uh, efficiency. So improvements in the heat rate to achieve Goals. And you can see in the green here, it's very, achieves very modest goals. So there's a decrease in carbon dioxide of 17.4% uh, from 2005 value, and it's only a 2.2% decrease from the reference case. So pretty, pretty small. Uh, then uh, the next one is the electricity sector improvement. This is similar to the clean power plan. We were actually felt very fortunate that, that our scenario. Uh, coincided uh, fairly nicely with the, uh, the administration proposal. It's moderate stringency, high flexibility. There's a benchmark of emissions established for each state. It gives the state lots of flexibility, promotes energy efficiency, promotes the use of uh, renewables. So this is projected uh, to decrease carbon dioxide emissions by 35% from the 2005 baseline value and 23% from the decrease from the reference case in 2020. Some of you may ask why we picked 2005 as a reference case and that's simply what the administration did so we used the same, same benchmark as they did. Can you, um, if, if that was extended to 2030, would you see significant? I'll show you a comparison if you need <laughs> to between what the actuality is. Actually the draft plan, the actual plan compared to what we've done. So, okay. good, good question. Anyway, so the next one is what we call the cost of carbon. 
So this is sort of mimicked as a carbon tax and a tax. But it, it, it's very instructive, I think. It, it, it is, uh, so the high stringency, moderate flexibility. And so what we did is we pegged uh, the cost of carbon dioxide at the uh, $43 per metric ton. Uh, so this is uh, so this uh, scenario does not allow for demand side uh, energy efficiency it's on the supply side basis. It's very stringent, as I indicated. It uh, decreases, projected to decrease carbon dioxide emissions by almost 50 percent from 2005 values and 39 percent uh, compared to the reference. Why does that case not have demand side energy efficiency? Well, I I don't think it's you know a lot of people are advocating a carbon tax. Right, but yeah. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't. I mean, you probably know more about politics than I do. I just don't think it's a viable. Oh no, no, I agree with that. But I just, I just, in terms of the scenario analysis, I just surprised yeah. that you model carbon tax by assuming no end use energy. I think it's a, it's a private sector tax, market driven situation where the companies are willing to pay any control costs up to that forty three dollars per ton, but they're not going to necessarily invest in. Okay, so the model is just simply investment between the right. and the exactly. one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, a little bit about, and Kathy talked a little bit about the baseline. I mean, the energy dynamics are changing very, very quickly. And so you have to realize that we did this analysis back uh, in, well, we started these projections in 2013. And so even it's only been a few years, but things have changed tremendously, as Kathy showed you on your one slide. So uh, we have, I'm going to show you, if you, if, I'll show you this, the administration's final analysis uh, varies quite a bit from their interim analysis, and this is because of the baseline conditions. The baseline is going down, we're shifting away from coal towards renewables um, and towards natural gas. And so in the current Program we are we have updated our reference case to reflect these conditions, but it's, a, it's a definitely a very rapidly moving. I'm going to show you a few slides like this bar diagram. So remember we have the reference case which is in blue. <coughs> scenario. So the inside defense line scenario is in red. The scenario that is a sector improvement scenario like the clean power plan is in green, and the, the tax is like uh, is shown here in purple. The uh, a very stringent program. So these are these are just showing you distributions of uh, fossil fuel generation from the IPM model. So you can see some uh, some differences. So you can see, for example, here in the far side, this is coal using carbon capture and storage. So because of the cost of carbon, that becomes in play. It becomes operable. So that's implemented to a greater extent. Um, if you you can also see a little bump up here. We'll talk a little bit about that right here for um, for the coal without uh, carbon capture and storage. So you can see that there are some differences in terms of fossil fuel generation among these programs, and you'll see those play out as one show you some of the results. And this is the other side. These are other sources of generation: nuclear, hydro, wind, biomass. This is energy efficiency and other renewables. So you can see nuclear comes into play under this carbon tax scenario. And you can see there's a lot of benefits associated with not using fuel associated with the promotion of energy efficiency here in the case of the, the, uh, the energy sector improvements. Okay, in terms of the emissions, which are really the driver here, this is the same sort of diagram, but for carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide, you can see that in general, there's very little difference between the reference case and the inside defense line. Uh, scenario. There is a little bump up in sulfur dioxide, which is, which is interesting. Uh, for the other two scenarios, though, there is quite a decrease, as we talked about, in carbon dioxide, and that translates to rather large decreases also in terms of the projections for sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. <coughs> just summarizing this, what I just showed you, a little increase in the weaker standard, the inside defense line standard. And these stronger standards, more stringent standards, more flexible standards allow for greater emission reduction for sulfur dioxide. I'm not to talk about mercury, but mercury also. Okay, 
so I think one of the great outputs of this, you know, Kathy, I certainly didn't realize this. Kathy probably thought it through, but we produced a series of maps. That to be here helped us make a lot of these maps. And um, I think that this was really gave this study a tremendous benefit because it would, we were interested in having a national conversation and people are interested in their air quality, their local air quality. So when we talk to a reporter from Chicago, we can tell what the projections would result in improvement in Chicago or in St. Louis. And many of the air, many of the areas that are challenged in terms of air quality have the greatest benefits as you'll see. I'm going to show you a series of slides here. These are different slides between the reference case and the various scenarios. So this is the energy sector improvement scenario. This is the one that's like the clean power plan. The more brownish colors represent a decrease, but the greatest decrease in fine particulate matter. And so you can see that there are pretty substantial improvements in most of the half of the country. Each one of these white dots here represents a major power plant. So not surprising is uh, positioned with, uh, right next to these operating coal fire, coal fire power plants. This is a similar figure, but with the comparing the reference case to the inside defense line scenario. So you can see that there's very, very, uh, very little difference. The scale is the same as what I showed you on the previous slide. In fact, some of these areas are showing an increase in particulate matter, and that's in part because of that bump up with respect to the, uh, the sulfur dioxide. Okay, this is ozone. This is again for the uh, scenario two, which is the energy sector scenario. You can see a lot of benefits. Again, the darker brown uh, colors represent decreases in uh, summer peak ozone concentration, much of the eastern half of the country. Lots of improvements in Texas and lots of improvements. And then this is the summer ozone for the, uh, the first. Uh, <coughs> defense line scenario. Again, you can see very modest changes. So, in terms of the air quality, we can see uh, some some uh, very marked differences across these various scenarios. Okay, so we took this output, this air quality output, and we put it into a epidemiological, epidemiological model, map to try to quantify the health benefits. And there were several outcomes which are shown here that we looked at. We try to be very conservative in our assumptions. We only try to use these health metrics that were very highly vetted. These are relatively controversial because there's a lot of things that are very important in terms of decision making in terms of air quality. But we feel that our analysis was relatively conservative. We really try to take a very conservative approach. So we looked at the benefits associated with concentrations of fine particulate matter and ozone. We looked at premature deaths avoided. Uh, we looked at reduced hospital emissions in terms of cardiovascular conditions and respiratory conditions. We also looked at air uh, heart attacks uh, in terms of elevated particular matter. So I'm going to show you a few slides on this. This is focusing in on the scenario that was similar to the clean power plant. This is on a state by state basis. This is for premature deaths avoided. And the deeper the purple color, the greater the deaths that are avoided. So it's a very simple thing. It's really not rocket science. If you've got a lot of population, you've got poor air quality, you're going to save a lot of lives. That's the bottom line. So if you think about those conditions, states like Pennsylvania and Ohio and you know, through the uh, the upper Midwest and Texas and so on and so forth, those are the states that have uh, a lot of benefits. The really, the only exception to this is New York State. New York State has a lot of population, and it's downwind from areas that are producing a lot of these air pollutants. So, this is the same slide, but we did this on a county-wide basis. So, you, the, the big driver in the last slide was the population of the state, the number of people. This normalizes on a per population basis, so you can really see, I think, more realistically what the benefits are. The deeper the green color, the greater the benefits in terms of life saved. And you can see that there are large areas of the country that have significant savings in terms of significant improvements in terms of life saves. In fact, all lower 48 states for which we did this analysis will have discernible health benefits. Okay. 
not a lot in the upper, you know, in the, in the northwest. But, uh, but there's so little improvement around LA because they're doing so much already. No, there's actually a lot of improvement. It just doesn't. It just it just doesn't clear out. Yeah, because you know, on a state so bad, <laughs> California, because it's got so many people, it yeah. does have a pretty big impact. Not as big as Texas, but pretty big. Uh, this shows some of the other metrics that we looked at in terms of hospital admissions avoidance. Some of that. Okay, we also did a, a cost-benefit analysis. So this shows you some of the analysis of this. So for those health benefits that I just talked to you about, it's estimated to be $29 billion per year. This is our confidence interval. If we compare that to the carbon benefits, if we assume $40 per short ton for the, as the social cost of carbon, that is about $21 billion a year. So actually, based on this analysis, our health benefits exceed the carbon benefits associated with it. So the secondary effects, the benefits you know, outweigh the uh, primary in terms of the primary objective. If we compare this to the cost, we've got quite a wide range of cost estimates. We can talk in some detail about a variety of approaches to estimate the annual cost, but the, 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 the middle value is $17 billion, so net benefit is $33 billion per year. So these are per year values. Once it's implemented, those will continue. <coughs> Okay, so these are the summaries of the health and air quality piece. So we've shown that the plan that is similar to the Clean Power Plan, that is flexible, or involves incentives for energy efficiency and renewable, uh, can have widespread co benefits, benefiting significantly across the whole 48 states. The 12 states, in terms of the greatest benefits, are shown here. Generally, those are ones with relatively high populations and relatively for air quality, and uh, our, our cost benefit analysis suggested it's quite cost effective. Okay, a little bit on ecosystem benefits. As I mentioned, we looked at effects of acid rain, we looked at effects of ground level ozone, and we looked at visibility effects. Just a few things on this. This is for the, the plan that is the scenario two plan, power plan. These are all, these different dots represent the various class one areas uh, that are applicable in terms of the regional haze rule. And the upper panel represents an improvement in visibility, a change in something known as depth of view. So how far you can see the landscape. Because the air quality is poorer in the east, you see a very a, a greater response. But if you but the visibility <coughs> visibility is much greater in the west because of less moisture in the air. And so this lower panel right here represents the amount of years that a site would project towards reaching their goals through the regional haze rule. Because the inherent visibility is better in the west, a little bit of improvement in visibility goes a long way towards improving their standards of reaching the, their goals for the regional haze rule by the year 2064. So this is what's known as the glide path. And you can see some of these sites in the Mountain West uh, receive several years of uh, advancement towards uh, reaching their goals through this glide path. We also did work through the help of Shannon Capps, uh, who helped us with looking at crops and um, and tree production. So these are some maps of crop distributions of corn, cotton, potato, and wheat. And then for different tree species, we applied algorithms to take our ozone concentrations, apply them over the summer growing season, and make projections for uh, loss of uh, productivity. I like Shannon a lot, but I don't think she's very good at producing graphics. This is very complicated, but I'll walk you through it. So these are the various crops that we looked at, potato, soybean, and in the reference case, this is the loss of productivity shown in the gray bar. Each one of these little symbols here represents the diminishing of that loss associated with implementing the plan. So in terms of soybean, if we put in scenario two, which is this blue uh, square, then this loss of soybeans would be diminished by about 9%. Not very good. That's what two other mice do. 
<laughs> but I'm very happy that she got to the paper in I offered her that I would do her graphics, but she wouldn't let me. <laughs> and then we have the same thing for uh, <coughs> in regions or highly sensitive to ozone. Okay, so this is getting to Chapman's question. You can, you can do, uh, pay attention to that. Okay, so this is comparison across these policies. So these are three outputs here. Uh, sulfur dioxide emissions averted, nitrogen oxide emissions averted, and premature death averted as a function of what we're trying to accomplish, the elimination of carbon, carbon dioxide So these symbols here, this uh, uh, purple triangle is the inside defense line. Scenario. This is our clean power plant scenario, carbon tax scenario, and these uh, green circles represent the two uh, analyses that were done by the EPA. The draft plan was done here, and then this is the final plan right here. And so you can see some differences here across from what EPA had from the draft plan to what they came up with a year later, and that is due to that shifting baseline. Fact that we are moving towards more renewable, more use of natural gas, and so that's greatly affecting the baseline. But you can see that our results fall generally within within this range. You can see this space, you know, of a very stringent program, and you can see what it does in terms of premature death avoidance. It's comparable to what we see. I didn't show you the map in the interest of time, but the spatial distribution. You can see that the spatial distribution. Plays out so much, uh, so much differently. So I think those three policies uh, you know, helped us understand the, uh, you know, the trade-offs between these different options. Okay, so then what we're interested in now is with the actual clean power plan, what might we, what might we do? So we have a project now which again is just underway, and we want to try to look at the clean power plan. But the clean power plan is not, unfortunately, is not. The final <laughs> there are a lot of things that are still being argued about and so on and so forth about how it might be how it might be implemented. So we are looking at uh, four or four scenarios plus a, a reference case. The reference case is 2030 without implementation of the clean power plan. And so these represent all the trade-offs that are potentially to be considered in terms of implementing the policy. Is there going to be a math-based standard or a rate-based standard? What does that mean? A math-based standard is a cap for an individual state. So it can't be said, once this program is implemented, if it ever gets out of the courts, it's going to go to the states. And the states are going to have to implement what's known as a state implementation plan and say how they are going to achieve this standard. And they have a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of doing that in the existing Plan. Okay, so is it is there going to be a cap for their state, or is it going to be a rate base based on the emission from an individual utility source? Okay, and then it will be summed up for that individual state. Is, is it going to include existing units or existing plus new units? Is it going to consider, consider national trading or just state trading? So these are the various options. They're still out there on the table that we are we are evaluating. So we can look at, you know, the effects of a rate base versus a NAP base. Existing units or existing plus new national trade. So this is the emissions. We started, I, I said this week on the ITM run. We're right in the middle of doing the air quality modeling. So this is the business as usual and these are the various scenarios that look at NAP versus rate, different trading options, existing versus new. These are the differences in emissions. These are just for uh, uh, utilities, um, so carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. We do have, this come out before, okay, but anyway, but, uh, so we do have these maps on emissions on a state by state basis. This shows differences between the scenario of interest and the business as usual case. So a negative value represents a decrease from the business as usual case. And so I don't want to get in the weeds here, but let's just say that these different options are showing very different spatial patterns. 
some of them, for me, are head scratchers. I don't really understand why Ohio doesn't do much of anything and why things are terrible in what is Yeah, well, Michigan is more, and in North, in North Carolina, it's weird. You know, so there's some of this. This is carbon dioxide. This is sulfur dioxide. What's going on with Wisconsin? I have no idea. Is this the Paul Ryan thing? I don't, I don't know what's happening here. So there's some of these things that, that we have to talk with people and try to find out why we see the output <coughs> for nitrogen oxide. So this is in progress. We will then try to do the same type of analysis that we would do. We would then take the results, look at the specific air quality at the local scale, and try to look at the health benefits. And hopefully we will not only inform the national understanding, but we also will have a conversation with the states. The states are key in this process because they are the ones who are implementing the plan. Okay, so one bottom line, we see a we shift towards the cleaner energy sources with improved energy efficiency and a shift towards removal. We can not only reduce carbon dioxide, but there are tremendous co-benefits. There are these are very you know, they will save us money, okay, they will save health costs. So the the savings across the whole domain will exceed the exceed the cost and it benefits across the entire US. Again, more benefits in the east than the and the amount in the west, but benefits across all the all the Okay, so now I'm gonna hand it back to Kathy and she's gonna talk a little bit about outreach and sort of Fallout from our, uh, from our no, response. Yeah. Okay, so um, we were aware of the policy timeline and we wanted our information to be relevant to the decision. And so um, as we worked through to a publication, we also generated a couple of white papers. So the expected timing of the draft rule was June 2014. So we put out our first white paper on the air quality change in May. Um, not long after June, around the time of the public comment period, uh, the 90 day public comment period window, we were able to put out a white paper on the health collection um, prior to the end of the public comment period for those draft tools. Then the final rule was introduced in August 2015, and in May of that year, um, our publication in Nature Climate Change was, was published online. Um, for me, who's someone who's working at that interface, and you often hear how science is lagging way behind the decision making process. This was part of the process that I was trying to attend as we as we went, while at the same time safeguarding the scientific integrity. So you never want to be putting out my papers of course without peer review unless you're feeling very confident about what goes into that. And because these models had been used for years and years and very well vetted and we were not actually we were basically turning the knobs on these models. There was very little that would likely to be wrong or need to be changed. So we felt comfortable taking a white paper approach here. And then uh, part of the work of the Science Policy Exchange is also to help translate and disseminate the results. And so we did a couple of things. We generated this joint press release. You know, I actually love to write and I love science writing, so this writing is no problem. Hardest part of this, top. <laughs> the lo negotiation around the logo. <laughs> But we did get a joint press release out with all those logos on it, and everybody and all the press offices and all those institutions sent it out the same version, very nearly so, um, at the same time on the same day. Um, in addition to having <coughs> the national press release, we did individual state-based press releases for those states that see uh, the 12 highest benefits. So we really went for national coverage as well as state-based media. To support the state-based media coverage, we produced infographics with the um, air quality results and information over a 10-year period of the health benefits for each of those top 12 states. Um, we also worked with Syracuse University to produce a video um, news release about the project and have a website. The project website is hosted here at Syracuse, and I believe it's still active. Now you can find a lot of information about this project right here on this um, website. All the data are available to Including all the data um, and links to the models that were used, they're publicly accessible models, which is also very important to us. 
So these were internal sort of products that we developed. Um, we also have a media and outreach strategy. So we had journalists we were reaching out to in all of those states. A colleague and I actively pitched the story to those journalists. And we had scientists trained as spokespeople ready to go um, when we went public. So here are just some, um, some highlights from some of the media coverage we've um, we received it was in the New York Times. Um, if any of you know Seth Bornstein, AP, is there, it's kind of a real tool to get a Seth Bornstein story. He's a national AP writer, so that, just, that story just went everywhere. Um, it was also uh, on the front on the Washington Post, so they, they reproduced our map in the print edition of the Washington Post, which was pretty fun. And then it had a strong social media presence as well, so it was um, it showed up at the top of this Barack Obama Facebook, which is not the same as the POTUS Facebook um, um, account I should mention, which is run by an actual organization. And then um, President Obama's uh, climate science advisor, Brian Deese, actually pegged it with a link to the Syracuse video, which means it stayed at the top of his Twitter feed for a number of days. And then, uh, in addition, there was a grassroots organization in Kansas City, Missouri that um, organized a grassroots event in which they handed out sunflowers like, in the number of the number of premature deaths avoided and things like that. So everything from you know very high level media coverage in the Washington Post to traditional media to grassroots organizing, the information got out there and was used, to the best of our knowledge, used really quite accurately. So that's those are the two key things, right? You want the coverage, but you actually want the story to be right. Um, and we work pretty hard on training. I actually view the sort of second part of that to be on us. If we <coughs> do our job well, we can actually do a really good job of making sure that coverage is accurate. So here's sort of the summary of the of the media coverage. It was in more than the outlets. Some of those major stories that I mentioned it also got picked up on some really great blogs. Like I love any any time you see in box sentences or salon or grist. You know, science can show up in grist. Kind of fun. <laughs> um, we also went radio, so we did. Um, I'm sure Charlie's still recovering <laughs> from the radio interviews. Um, again, state-based as well as national, and then we had uh, quite a lot of social media activities. How many of you are familiar with this publication by the Union of Concerned Scientists? Okay, a couple of you. Great. So, what what do we have a history of seeing happen in this country when? Really effective science gets out there and has strong policy implications. We sort of have an environment of, of harassment that goes on, right? Think of the tobacco days, or think of um, acid rain days, or climate change, or even sort of um, research on fetal tissue. Um, there is a pretty well developed community of people who are likely to take uh, an opportunity to try and personally attack. Usually not attacking the science, actually usually trying to um, see if there's someone who can personally attack a researcher to try to undermine your results um, to serve the interests of the industry that they represent. So um, we had uh, we had the opportunity to experience some of that. I'm very pleased to say that it was to little to no effect. Um, and our whole team has come back for the second phase. We learned a tremendous amount. I think we're much smarter and wiser. And it, in retrospect, it was actually kind of interesting. So we wanted to share some of that with you um, in case any of you do this kind of research. Um, part of what I see our mission as being now is to sort of help to educate other scientists and the next generation of scientists about this issue. And it was actually this, this very issue was on Science Friday last week. So you can listen to that as a podcast. So what are some of the things that happen? Happened. Here are some of the things that happen to, unfortunately, dozens of scientists and that we also experience. So there's hate email, and the hate email is intended to get you to say something in response, and, and anything in response that they could then sort of pull out of the email and post on a blog site. So uh, that's one thing that happens. Um, sending letters to universities. Um, claiming all kinds of things about you or the research. Uh, in our, in this case, it was um, related to a one of our colleagues that received EPA funding in the past for a particular center. So this is 
you know, a competitive peer review grant process and unrelated to this research, um, but they claimed that because we hadn't disclosed it in the journal article that there was some hidden conflict of interest. So there was an attempt to generate a controversy. They actually approached the journal editor with that same claim that this represented a conflict of interest, and they were trying to get the editor to post some kind of um, either either retraction or correction that then they could take that and run with it to the mainstream media. So they're trying to actually you know, drive some sort of you know, discrediting, find something that they can grasp um, to get your, your science discredited. Um, another tactic is to FOIA, so you to use the Freedom of Information Act, and to FOIA the emails of the UK EPA officials to um, to the scientists to see if there's any um, anything that you find in those emails that would suggest there's some sort of collusion or something like that, some sort of bias in the, in the research. So that happens. Um, then there's often a threat to subpoena you. Um, that um, they will approach a member of Congress to subpoena you to testify before Congress about your work. And then a uh, very unageable tactic is to sort of claim that the, the research is based on secret science and that therefore it's not to be trusted. Kathy, do you think the fact that you are all private universities helped with the FOIA request? You know, you see from Pennsylvania, from Virginia Tech, that they have been more successful about getting emails. Um, did that help? Yeah, so they emailed, when they emailed EPA, when they pointed EPA, they got all the email correspondence. So I, I suppose there was some email that they couldn't access. They, they couldn't, couldn't access they couldn't internal. Enjoy our email. Yeah. Or they didn't. Um, you know, the, the good news of all this is that nothing nothing came of this because the first rule in all of this is to be above reproach, right? And you have the highest integrity in the work that you do. And from there, you know, there is not not the only worry at that point is that someone will fabricate. Based on piece information, <coughs> and piece together in a, you create a new narrative or a, something, a false statement about about you, and that somehow that will gain credibility. Um, in this case, you know, back in when this first started, well, it started happening in the 70s, but it continues to this day. Michael Mann and the hockey stick papers pretty much the same example of it. Um, so it's become much less effective over time because it's been seen for what it is. Um, and usually it's more of a smear campaign and, and, and usually not about the science. So we had a great um, response team, you know, as some of this starts to occur. So um, there were our team authors who I would say were, were amazing in just to coordinate with this all state and touch. Um, and then uh, I was able to access some very experienced university administrators at Harvard who interestingly deal with this all the time. They were like, oh yeah, and they knew the individuals. Like, oh yeah, that guy again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they were actually, I mean, they had to do their due diligence with this. They had to look at, they had to read the paper, they had to talk to us, but then they were like, yep, got it, no problem. <laughs> and that, that was really great, and we were able to learn from them. And they were like, don't even, don't even respond to this. You know, so that, the, that was a key lesson is that not every inquiry is worthy of you. Um, they, they actually wrote, there was a letter from the university that sort of laid out um, uh, um, how, how um, strong our work was. So um, they were actually willing to issue a letter in support of our team. Uh, then there, uh, there was help here from Syracuse University as well, and then also um, some of the foundation uh, community had some expertise to lend. So these are just a few ideas. None of these are like earth shattering, but I just thought I'd share with them. But, you know, the first thing is uh, if this is to ever happen to you, and what we say to our team now is just do not respond. So as soon as an email like that comes in or Twitter post directed at you, just do this stop. Coordinate with your team, take a look at where this is coming from, and decide whether to do anything. But never react. That's what they're trying to get you to do, right? They're trying to get you to overreact, go, 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 and hope that you'll say something that will make you look bad. 
It's always good to know and follow your university's compensation policy to make sure your disclosures and financial disclosures are all up to date. Uh, we went the extra mile of posting all of our CVs, all of our data, all of our models, because there was nothing to hide. So the more transparent in our mind, the better. Um, it's always important to maintain part of my job is this sort of quarterbacking, that interaction with public officials and other external groups. Uh, to make sure that there aren't any overstepping of, of boundaries at any point in the process. Um, it's been really important that if you're interacting with public officials to just email them to just phone call. It's just too easy for somebody to like take something out of context and create a false narrative from it. So much better to talk to people by phone. And then um, I've been increasingly thinking that it was useful to to offer some education or I don't know how to training or provide new CDS new concerned science booklet to university administrators. We were so lucky to have a very seasoned team at Harvard who was very familiar with this. Um, and, and they really were like thoroughly, oh yeah, <laughs> we got this. Um, but that may not be the case everywhere. So to the extent that um, that this kind of thing can happen, I think that's useful part of the process. Right. I'm going to go back to the slide, but that's the consensus from us. Charlie, that was a wonderful presentation of balancing our science also with really informing public policy and the time frame that really has made it. Um, I So the, the health benefits would even have been greater if you had used the original social company. So this was 40 is the, the revised definition. So the, the going back to the, the skinny that looks like you would even have had it <coughs> had more impact on those numbers because of the original. Yeah, and I think we were also extremely conservative in yeah, our health right. benefits. We exactly. really lowballed that because we realized that that was the point of criticism. So we wanted to be as, you know, really as rock solid as we possibly could. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we didn't include any pediatric. So pediatric right. asthma right. was off included. We did not include that. So um, any questions for Charlotte and Kathy? Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much for a great presentation. It's great to have you here. Fun. Very fun. Um, so just starting with the slide that's on the on the screen. Um, so Kathy, when you got down to number five, I was anticipating that you would you were going to say, so you said just set up a call because then it's better to be in a conversation to communicate the information. I was anticipating that you were going to say, don't put anything in the email to a public official because it's foil. Well, that's not that's why. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should, I should have pointed yeah. that out specifically, but that's that's why. And again, uh, what what's really important is that you never want to be having conversations that don't meet the utmost standards of integrity. But what you're worried about in this case is that someone gets a hold of it and, and uses it in, improperly, like find ways to put your words together to mean something that. At all intent. There's right. nothing. There's also nothing in John Podesta's email from Kathy. <laughs> 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 so they, even though WikiLeaks is, is interested, it's not there. So one person took a email that I had exchanged with somebody from the EPA, took part of it, and then put it with a quote that I had from a reporter from Buffalo. But it's this weird, <laughs> I mean, it was just bizarre, you know, so you're, you're, you're just opening right right yourself up to that sort of activity. Then the, the other comment you shared about when you went to university administrators, they said, oh, yeah, oh, this is so-and-so. Uh, so that suggests that maybe that person's attack is not about this particular science, but it may be about something else. It may be about a position about the university or just science in general. Um, and I share that for COE, we've been the recipient of a public 
comment over over the years, and so, sometimes it seemed that uh, that it was about say the chancellor. So it was like an act. It was an opportunity since it was a story about the COE. It was oh yeah, this is you know this is a really you know a, a, something that the chancellor is doing that I don't like. So do you have a sense that you know that, that the attack was against say Harvard or Syracuse University or and not about the science, but it was really you happen to be the lightning rod of the day. I mean, we, we just we know it's actually been chronicled in books that these very same individuals did this in the case of the uh, tobacco um, health benefits research. And, I mean, I I think it goes something it goes something to you know what's the role of government, how much are we regulating industry, um, you know, it also goes to who's getting paid for for the for this work. I mean, I'm trying to sort of just be a little bit. Diplomatic in how I respond to these questions, but I think that those dynamics are all very real. Same thing. If you looked at the uh, one that the government did the national climate assessment, the, the last one, the same set of uh, organizations that were making these inquiries were the same organizations that sat around the world looking for any opportunity um, for using information that would, would either discredit the science. If you're, I mean, it's a history of this misuse of a state from Harvard, but a book called Worth the Doubt. It's a very good account of this as a recovery history. Any other questions? Okay. I'm sort of surprised that the slide showed less benefits from the final rule than the draft. Oh, what happened is the reference case goes down. In other words, the reference oh, the reference air quality is better. <coughs> so the difference oh, the reference the baseline. So the baseline change the baseline. Yeah, okay. We've actually strengthened the standard. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and part of that is, you know, the, the glide path to achieving the standard is, is shallower. Yeah. Um, and so you know but the, and it assumes things like the renewal, uh, renewal of, of the renewable energy tax credit, which hadn't been in the first reference case, it updated energy efficiency assumptions and made it more assertive than in the first reference case. So that reference case was getting cleaner and cleaner, and then the difference was less. Yeah. Now, another question is the, uh, the states that are most likely to avoid the renewable coal benefits would probably be coal producing states because they might. Incur the cost of carbon sequestration and storage, even though it's more costly to protect coal mining jobs. And I'm wondering if anybody has any plans doing outreach for this sort of data in coal producing. Do you have that? Does your, your map show a lot of benefit in coal producing? No, they, they, they have the lion's share, the worst air quality is the lion's share of the, yeah. the West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. They all have tremendous benefits. I would go on talk shows in some of these states. And I was figuring I was going to get my head in. But there's a lot of people in these states that are really whipped up about air quality. Yeah. I really got a pretty, I was very happy. I got a pretty good reception on some fairly conservative talk shows because of the message about air quality. A lot of people are, are worried about air quality and they want to have better and better air quality. They're very concerned about, you know, this is in many of these states are not in in terms of their air quality standards. So they, you know, they get real benefits that help, help their people. So, uh, you know, and, and sort of just talking to the person on the street, there was, there was a lot of interest in this. So, yeah. No, I think, I think it's good because it sort of turns the conversation away from climate change to other things that are really important in people's lives, things that people can relate to. Nobody, Nobody will ever acknowledge that the temperature is increasing because it happens in such a slow rate, right? They just can't relate to it. The general, you know, I mean, I was with the record for 50 years, so I know what's really going on, but most people don't, you know, just it's warmer, it's colder, you know, it just is what it is. But air quality, that's something that people they can relate to when they care about. I wonder what those numbers would look like if you normalize them, like premature deaths per thousand population or something like that. I mean, it's pretty easy to say that the state with a lot of people is more likely to have more deaths, but 
if you normalize them, what would that picture look like? Yeah, so the green, the green, the green pie, pie, that's normalized on a per person basis. Let me go back to that. <coughs> yeah, so that's on a per person basis. But we did it both ways. Okay. But we presented, yeah, I didn't we presented it on a state basis because part of our audience is the state. So we can show the state, the state official, this is what we estimate that you're going to do. So it's the state that are doing it, states that have to show how we communicate what we're doing. The state seems like we need it. So if you look at it on a per person basis, it's, it's, yeah. it's very distributed. It's very distributed, right, right, right. It's, you know, the, there's quite large benefits across the East State Department. It's very similar to the PM. The PM. Kathy. I think one of the interesting parts here is that you're doing a lot of communication that a lot of other science work doesn't necessarily get. What have you learned from this? What are have there been any surprising <coughs> wins or any surprising failures that you've discovered? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's always really encouraging when the science is accurately depicted in the news, and so I think we were really pleased with that. I'm a big believer in you just pound the message to death until you get it right. You know, you work it internally until it's right, you get those words nailed down. I mean, the difference between two and four can sometimes make a difference in terms of accurate or not. So we work that over really hard internally. Uh, we then train the team. Like, we get the to those people who we train and we do role playing. We do all that work. And then also when our materials go out, people know those messages. We did have a junior scientist who, you know, his, his experience showed a little bit in a couple of the interviews in the way that he asked questions. So that tends to be the hardest part. Like you can get your message out because you've rehearsed it, but the, the questions you don't know are coming and how you respond to those. Um, so I might spend more time with the with the younger scientists in the training process. I think. Uh, I think as much as I was aware, fully aware of the harassment culture we live in, we did not prepare anything. And so I think that was a real shortcoming on Mars and my part. I mean, I had known from Dean Lycan from years ago. He had told me stories about, you know, contracts being put out on his work to demonstrate his, he was wrong. You know, so we knew this. Um, but frankly, it, it only happens when the science reaches such a level that it's so um, high profile and so high impact that it's worth their time to come after you. And so I didn't anticipate that we'd get there, and we did. Um, I think thankfully we were really staffed on our feet. And that's why I mean the team worked really well together. And because we've been working as a team for a couple of years, and I love team, doing teams well, they everybody's instinct was pretty much to connect with each other to see what we do. And so I think we did a good job accessing resources and responding effectively. But I wish I wish I'd been a little more ahead of that. Um, I don't um, we can see a lot of benefits from the, uh, from the model. Um, can you give me some more information how to use the to improve the, the air quality? Well, it's fairly simple. Coal is fairly dirty fuel, so if you burn less coal, you get better air quality. So it's not very fairly straightforward. So if you shift your fuel sources, if you provide incentives for these cleaner alternatives, energy efficiency, so you burn less fuel. If you go more towards renewables, there are going to be benefits associated, uh, associated with that. Some of these things that I didn't talk about, the increase in sulfur dioxide, that's a phenomenon known as emission rebound. So what happens is that if you improve the efficiency of a power plant, even if it's a coal power plant, it will, it will move up in the order. It will burn for a, it will operate for a longer period of time. So there's sort of a disincentive to this. It's not a huge effect, but it's interesting. People have theorized that this might happen in our analysis. Suggests that it could, it could happen. Uh, so that was just having the site, the heat rate efficiency improved, so the plant was more efficient, so it was allowed to operate for a greater period. So there's the emitting more, more sulfur associated with the coal combustion. So I think it's, you know, it's 
fairly, fairly straightforward. Not, not very complicated. Well, that's a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I can explain. I think we can all agree that we're on a wide map. The rest of the world is not. Certain areas and countries. Is there any um, thought about trying to um, conduct research more on a global perspective in countries like India or China? Or to reflect, to reflect on the fact that the baseline amount of coal consumed for power generation is really going to stay the same until 2040. So while we're diminishing, other countries are ramping up or doubling their their electric production from coal. Like yeah. Is there somebody who funds such a study? Yeah, no way. <laughs> you know, people have talked to us about trying to develop this approach uh, and then partner with countries like China to try to do a demonstration project and look at what, what, might, be, what might be accomplished. And we would love to do that. It's just a matter of getting the right the right people. We've talked to groups about that, but it's very much on our own. This is a great idea. And this is only one sort of category, too. So this also Um, are you going to investigate any of the um, potential benefits of, uh, for instance, childhood um, disease or um, you know disability related to um, lung disease? You know, not aside from mortality. Well, what do you see it as healthcare costs? Some well, people are very, are very interested in environmental justice issues, and so if we get some. If we get funding to address that, because we have very, you know, pretty granular observations, and so we can look across it. Some people, some of our team, does not feel like it's worth. We won't see very much, but we've had a lot. We've had some interest in various, particularly NGOs, in uh, advancing asking these types of questions. And I think maybe more broadly, I think this idea of co-benefits. I mean, I think it has a lot of legs. This is just one example. There's a lot and lots of co-benefits out there. I think it could be a field of endeavor to think about smart ways of doing things, killing multiple birds with one stone, you know, investing in resources wisely. I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 a great, it's a great thing that, you know, institutions should be engaged in. Yeah, did you want to say No, we did look at some of the respiratory issues. In as well. the, a question around the pediatric is pediatric asthma. Over the hospital admissions rate. Right? Yeah, yeah. Indoor air quality on um, the pediatric or at least the literature is still kind of big. Some people do include it. Um, but as Charlie said, we, we wanted to actually be conservative in our assumption. Questions on the web? Um, people are on the web enough? No. Question in the back, maybe. Yeah, the question about the, you know, the, the business as usual um, assumptions in terms of renewables adoption and the natural you look at uh, wind and solar and their uh, cost of energy decreasing compared to the established fossil fuels and millennia you know, that are centuries old. How was that assumption made? When was it? And has, that sh has the cost of energy shifted much you know, in the time since that decision was made to, to now? Yes. Yes. I mean, the initial but back in 2013, and then for the recent study, I mean, it's 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 a completely it's a completely changed system, and it really challenges us going forward. How do we, do we know it's going to continue to change at the at the current rate? It's 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 extremely important, and it's just very hard to you know it, you know it's hard to know if it's going to continue along the trajectory that it that it is, or is there mm -hmm. some sort of ceiling or floor that we're going to run up against? The Energy Information Administration actually does forecasts, and so our first uh, analysis was based on the 2013 forecast out to 2020. And then by the time we finished that and started the new, that forecast has been updated, and often the, the penetration of renewables is much greater just in that short window. Yeah, it's and partly because it's, it's some policy incentives. Oh, you're Choice number two, the, the scenario number two, seems significantly better than number one. Is it, well, so is it not being pursued because the EPA is not allowed to um, act outside the, the power plant and the, the political system wouldn't support 
something more like number two. So we chose number one because it's something you could do more by um, executive order rather than having to go through legislative means or whatever. Well, this is through the EPA. Two is, uh, two is the one closest to the board. Yeah. Oh, okay. One is the EPA. Advocated by many people at the electric utility sector because that was thought to be the domain of operation only within the fence line. So we try to look at these different policies that reflect very contrasting conditions. Why did I ask that? Yeah, I think you. I got off on that. But it turns out to be a great contrast because this is now what's being argued in court is whether or not it needs to look like. One or can it look like scenario? And we see the difference, huge difference. Okay, I think we should give them another hand. <laughs>